Hello, everyone, and welcome to the most interesting breakout session of the evening. But I would say that, wouldn't I? Sea Search are going to take you on a whistle stop tour of our seas from the almost tropical Channel Islands in the far south to the rugged landscapes of Scotland that you've already seen in the north to show you some of the most amazing marine wildlife that lives there. We're going to start in the shallows amongst the kelp forest where there's plenty of sunlight for the seaweeds to grow and form lush meadows. Then we'll go a bit deeper and check out some of the animals living on and around the rocky reefs. And finally, we'll venture into the darkness of a Scottish sea lock where wonderful anemones and sea pens emerge from the gloom. Standing at the coast and looking out at the often murky water, especially at this time of year, it can be difficult to believe what's under the surface. As divers and snorkelers, we're privileged to enter that watery world and bring back these images to share with you. You don't have to be a marine biologist to get involved with Sea Search. You just have to have an interest in the marine life and want to find out more. Record what you see, share your sightings with us and help marine conservation. Our contact email address is shown at the end of the film. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll answer them at the end. But for now, sit back and enjoy the film.
everyone, welcome back. Did you enjoy that? Did anybody see the eel? It was uh, it was lurking really quite um, quite dark in 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 the kelp. It was it was very well hidden, I think. Um, so some questions. We've had some questions come in. Sue H has said, "I don't scuba dive, but I do spend time at the seashore, in and out of the water. Is there any way I can get involved with sea search?" Um, yes, Sue, you can. Um, it was originally a program for divers and snorkelers, but if you're at the seaside and you see something interesting, you can certainly let us know. Uh, you can let the MCS know if you take a picture. Um, we can help you with identification. Um, all of that would be great. We will we will engage with you and, and help you to, uh, to to know what you saw at the seaside. So it'd be great to hear from you. Um, Another question come in from Paul M. How has COVID affected the Sea Search program this year? Well, Paul, it's it's been a bit of a funny old year, I have to say. Um, we have been getting out in the water. Um, obviously, during lockdown, really nothing happened at all. Um, we were all, even those of us who live, you know, at the coast, were were, were trapped in our houses. Um, but once the restrictions started to be lifted, we did have people going out and getting in the water and still sending in their sightings. So that was really important that we didn't have a completely blank year in terms of sightings and data and everything. Um, I, live, um, I live here at the coast uh, in Dorset and I've been getting out a lot in my, on my, local, in my local waters, snorkeling as well as diving. Um, I have been out on a boat a bit, but it's it's just been it's been a very abnormal year this year, and I fear that it's probably going to be fairly similar next year, unfortunately. Um, but I think the main thing is that we we all stay safe, we do what we can, and and we and we keep recording. Um, oh, lots of questions coming in now. Um, lots of people saying it's an amazing film. Thank you for that. It is. You know, UK marine wildlife is stunning. Everybody thinks you need to go to the tropics and dive on coral reefs, and you really don't. I I love diving here in the UK in the in the sort of the colder green water. Um, uh, a question from David T. The lump sucker seemed to have pink spots. What was that? Um, unfortunately, these these fish they do get infected with with sort of parasites that live on them, and that's what those bright pink spots were. And it seems to be particularly common with lump sucker. I don't know why, but they they do seem to be prone to having those um, those those parasites living on them. So, oh, and Jane's saying the film was very relaxing. I'm I'm glad you enjoyed that, Jane. You can have it on as your as your background. <laughs> um, so, so another Charlotte, well named. Um, do you think there'll be problematic gaps in our C search data set because of COVID? There will be gaps, it's true. Um, I think in general, we, you know, we will have a gap in the data set. If anything particularly spectacular happened this year, then yes, we will have missed it. We have had volunteers going out and sending data in, so it's not completely blank. We hope that most of the change we're seeing is slow enough that if we pick up again next year, we won't completely have missed things. But you know, th that's that's the trouble. It's it's very dynamic, the marine environment. You know, the, you can have boom and bust years. Um, down here in Dorset, we had a couple of years where um, there were the big barrel jellyfish everywhere and they arrived and they were literally in their thousands. And then the, the, the next year, they were all gone and we don't we don't really know why. Um, so I hope we haven't missed anything like that. But you know, time time will tell, really. Um, the fact we have we have got some data, so that's that's something. But, um, Angus has asked, where do all the sea search records go? Oh, they they go on a long and exciting journey. After our sea search volunteers, they fill in the forms at the end of the, their dive or their snorkel, um, and then they submit them either to me directly, as the national coordinator, or to their local coordinators. They collect all those in, they check them to make sure that the, the dive didn't take place in the car park, for instance, so it was actually in the sea. Um, they check to see that nobody's recorded um, really unlikely things like blue whales in Portland Harbour, for instance. I mean, that would be fabulous, but not very likely. 
and then we collect all of the data up and we have some really dedicated people who spend a long time in the winter typing all of that data into the marine recorder database. And then it all comes back, we check it, we check it again, we check it again. And eventually it goes on to the National Biodiversity Network, Atlas, and it's all public and anybody can, can see where those records are. So you can go and check on your own records. Um, so that's, that's great, you can actually see where it's going. Um, Sarah has asked, do we have special cameras to film? It's very murky and everything looked gray brown. Um, what I use, it's, it's a normal camera, um, but it's in a waterproof housing. Um, generally, the biggest problem is that unless you're very shallow, so if you're snorkeling, it's fine, there's lots of light, but otherwise you need um, special lights or strobes um, to, to light it up so you can actually see the colours as they're supposed to be. Um, but it's it's just a, it's, it's a normal camera, really. Um, I've got, oh, I'm probably not allowed to say what I've got because it's advertising, um, but it's just a little compact camera and it works really well. Um, who else is it? Sally has said, where is my favourite dive site in the UK? Wow. Um, well, as I say, I, I live here in Portland in Dorset, so the fact that I can pretty much literally walk out of my front door and go diving in Chesil Cove, that's that's right up there. But really, I love everywhere. I, I, everywhere you dive is different. Um, here in Dorset, it's slightly different from Devon. It's different again if we go up the, um, the English Channel towards Sussex. Um, so everywhere I go, I find something new to look at. So I guess I don't really have a favourite dive site. Sorry. Um, Izzy has said, what was the animal name for how much it looks like crisps? <laughs> the name was hilarious and the organism was spectacular. Um, that's actually, it's, it's a colony of tiny little animals called a bryozoan or a sea mat or a sea moss. Um, and they, they, are, they do literally look like crisps. They can be anything up to a metre across. The really old ones, they grow very slowly, but they can be enormous. Um, and they are stunning. And so much life lives on and in and around um, those, those, um, those bryozoans. They're, they're, they're really, really special. Um, but they're quite fragile. So it's something else that's damaged by dr dredging and trawling and that kind of thing. Um, I must get on. Stop, stop waffling, Charlotte. Where's the most productive place I visited? I'm not sure what you mean by productive, Sarah. Um, we'll come back to that and maybe you'd like to elucidate, clarify that a bit and I'll come back to that. Um, Hannah has said, can you learn to dive with Sea Search? Unfortunately not. You do have to be a qualified diver already. Um, um, and then you can join in with our, with our organised surveys. But we would encourage you to join a local dive club, get involved um, there and learn to dive. And you can still do sea search with your local dive club as an independent person. Um, Martin has said, will the offshore wind farms planned be a danger to sea life? Whew. Now that's, that's gonna be, that is a tricky question. During the construction phase, when they're actually um, installing the turbines, there, there is evidence that the, the, the noise pollution um, is a problem for cetaceans and other marine life. Um, I think the jury is still out on whether um, it's a problem for migratory birds, depending on where they're sighted. But once they're in place, they become kind of a de facto marine protected area because generally you're not allowed to dredge or trawl in and around wind farms. And so it does afford a certain amount of protection to that area of the seabed, just by the fact that all of those turbines are there. Um, so I hope that sort of answered your question, Martin. We could talk about that for hours, honestly. Um, M Hall has said, what's the difference between a bobtail squid and a cuttlefish? Ah, this is the, the problem with common names. Um, a bob the little cuttle, what we call a little cuttle, <laughs> is also known as a bobtail squid. Um, so they're very similar organisms, but they're not the same species. Um, if you really want to be um, accurate about what you're calling something, you really need to use the scientific name, um, unfortunately, sorry. Um, Anna has said, the people who enter the data in the winter, are these volunteer roles? Um, unfortunately, this is, this is something that we have to pay people to do and they have to, um, they have to spend a lot of time developing the experience 
um, in order to what they call what we call biotoping. So actually putting the correct labels on on all that data in terms of labeling the habitats. So, Anna, I would encourage you to get involved with Sea Search and then you can work up to being a data enterer if you like. If you like that sort of thing, that would be great. It will teach you an awful lot about marine life, having to use the Marine Recorder database. But I'm afraid it's not a, a, a standard volunteer role at the moment. Sorry. Um, Sarah Mint, where has where have there been the most marine organisms present in one place? Whew. Well, you know what? This is probably the answer to this is probably one of the least sexy looking dive environments possible. And if you look at deep mud and if you if you took a cubic meter of, of, of the mud, such as in, in Pool Harbour, that all the, the birds feed on in the winter, there is so much packed into that that cubic meter. Um, but you can't see any of it because it's all buried in the mud. In terms of stuff you can actually see. Um, Ooh, now there's a good one. Um, green seas, in terms of um, productivity and the, you know the, the the overall food web, are much more productive than um, the blue, the, the you know the open ocean, because of course we've got all the plankton and all of that stuff that is very difficult to see. Um, in terms of really obvious stuff, reefs are generally where things congregate. You see all of the you know the stuff that's on the reef, the seaweeds or the sponges and squirts and stuff, and all the fish around the reef. So from a visual point of view, probably um, this is why everybody likes diving on reefs, I think, rather than on, on mud, muddy seabeds. But OK, another one, another Charlotte. It's great. There's loads of Charlottes on tonight. Who uses sea search data? Oh, I, was, I, I would say everybody, but it's they're used by statutory bodies. So the government, um, DEFRA, the, 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 the nature conservation bodies like Natural England here in England and Natural Resources Wales, Nature Scott, etc. All of those, they all use sea search data. Academics use sea search data. Um, environmental consultants use sea search data. It's all there on the NBN, on the National Biodiversity Network. And We've had, we've made a decision that that should all be freely available, so anybody can use sea search data. When we did a survey of our volunteers, they agreed that our data should be freely available, so everybody can use it, because that's what sea search is all about. You know, putting putting those pins on the map, telling people what's out there, and then we can have informed decisions about our marine environment. If if we don't tell everybody that there's a, a place is particularly special or there's really rare animals or, or things living there and we don't tell anybody then we can't really complain if if there's sort of um, activities going on that might damage those so I think being being open about our data is is definitely the way forward um, and then it's down to us as you know, educated citizens to put pressure on and for the, the MCS to campaign and to get you guys, to get everybody motivated to put that political pressure on. Um, Martin has said, a plastic bag filmed at the bottom of the Marianas Trench last year. We definitely don't do sea search that deep, Martin. That's, that's beyond us. Um, do we believe the campaign against the plastic bag is making progress? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, is it making progress or is it is it changing behaviour? I think it's it's certainly highlighted um, to, to to people that we need to think about these things. That it's you know an away isn't away. You know people throw things away and and often it ends up in the sea and because people don't see it, um, they believe it's gone. And I think it's very important that those of us who are the eyes under the sea can bring these things. Um, to, to wider attention and then make people realize um, that, you know, you, ca you can't just chuck it away. It ends up somewhere. But, oh, we're, and we've been told that that's it. I'm sorry, I could talk about marine life for hours, but I'm afraid that's it, people. So you had the, um, the contact address if you want to get involved. We'd love to hear from you. Hopefully lots more volunteers. So thank you very much.